Hello everyone, this is Bob and Threadvan. Welcome back to Bioshock Infinite. No need to see all the intro movies. But we do need to see the second Burial at Sea episode. Uh, where can we go from here, you might wonder? Well, the answer is, uh, back to Bioshock, because here's a uh, previously on. They told me, son, you were born to do great things. They were right. And that was the last word he ever said. I'm Atlas, and I aim to keep you alive. You think that's a child down there? She's a little sister now. Somebody went and turned a sweet baby girl into a monster. It's Ryan! Goddamn Andrew Ryan! Head to medical! Would you kindly get this? Would you kindly find that? Would you kindly find that? Would you kindly find that? Would you kindly head to Ryan's office and kill the son of a bitch? Did that airplane crash? Or was it hijacked? There ain't no Atlas, kid. The name's Frank Fontaine. I had you built! I sent you topside! I called you back, showed you what you was, what you was capable of. Even that life you thought you had, that was something I dreamed of. You saved them. You gave them the one thing that was stolen from them. A chance. So I guess the good ending is canon, then. Right, well, time to start the episode. Yes, yes. Still sticking with medium, I think. We just saw that, so no. The Poche du Ton Café. Nice. Still got the little pendant there in the left. I wonder if that changes to a cage if I had chosen differently in the most recent save. Comstock. Elizabeth, I am so sorry. No, you're not. But you're about to be. No, he, he did seem kind of sorry. What with whole ab the whole abandoning the Columbia thing. Mademoiselle. Yes. Quel est votre nom? Elizabeth. Pour vous, Elizabeth. Oh no, no, I I I couldn't. I I can't accept. Je vous en prie, j'insiste. Oh, thank you. That's right. This time we are playing as Elizabeth, not Booker. Bonjour, mademoiselle. Also, we are apparently on a sunny spring day in Paris. Like, impossibly sunny and impossibly spring here. Comment ça va, Elizabeth? Come to the city where everybody knows your name. Comment ça va, Elizabeth? Comment allez-vous, mademoiselle? Back when they paid for things in francs. Bonne journée, Elizabeth. Hmm. Wonder what he's using as a model for. Oh, that. That's what he's using as a model. Bonjour, Monsieur Surat. Ah, bonjour, Mademoiselle Elizabeth. Je manque d'inspiration aujourd'hui. Elizabeth. Wait a second. These are all extremely famous paintings. Bien le bonjour. 
A lot of landscape artists around here. A kid playing with a baguette. Of all things. Where is that music coming from? Well, hell, maybe that's the thing. This is the dimension of constant background music. I mean, again, when you're uh, talking about <laughs> infinity, literally anything is possible. Assuming you can search long and hard enough to find it. Tu as parlé à la jolie petite américaine? Oh, bonjour, mademoiselle. Hmm, charcoal drawings. Bonne journée! Comment ça va, Elisabeth? That is a lot of baked goods. Even some macaroons. Yeah, this is definitely the dimension of background music. I'm sorry, Cassette. Next time, I promise. Parisian clown. The rabbit, for some reason. No, I know the whole rabbit out of the hat thing. I just wasn't aware that was sort of a clown's repertoire. Bien le bonjour, Elisabeth. Comment allez-vous? Je peux vous vendre tous les livres que vous voulez, et pour pas cher en plus. Do you have The Age of Innocence by Edith Wharton? Désolé, ma petite, celui-là n'a pas encore été écrit. Huh. Okay. And I think that newspaper was about Elizabeth. So. Bien bonjour, Elizabeth. I know I said you could do anything with infinity, but. Parce que je me suis perdu dans tes yeux. A dimension that is simultaneously incurring inside and outside of her head, that is... I'm not sure that's how quantum physics works. How good these French accents are. I mean, do they get like actual French speakers or just a bunch of Americans fed them French lines? of paradise, perhaps? New and old books is what that sign says. Sally! 
Well now, this is definitely not a reality in which things get to be consistent. You can be everywhere at once. Why would you have to be stuck inside your own head? Well, these are um, silhouette paintings, drawings. Sally, wait! Like they would actually, they would place you behind a screen and then cut out your. Wait! Cut out your outline. Sally, stop! And now the bookstore is on fire. Sally, where are you going? Come Rest in Sally, peace, let me kill Meister. And now we're seeing pictures of transorbital lobotomies. Which again, stop, stop. were invented after the events of Bioshock Infinite, the original. Hmm. <laughs> Might be the first time we've seen that from the front. Kinda of was your fault, though. Empty. Empty again. What are the odds? What's the hold-up? Just having a bit of a laugh, Atlas. This ain't a sporting event. Put a bullet in her. No need to torture the poor girl. We're not animals, you know. All right, all right. Let her go! Quiet down, dear. In a minute, all your problems will be over. Elizabeth, tell him you can get him back. Booker? Uh, Booker, say, what? I don't I understand. Get, How? Say... I can get you back to Rapture. What? Just say it. I can get you back to Rapture. Put the gun down. Now, what was that you said about Rapture? I can get you back to Rapture. And how you plan on doing that, sister? You some kind of magician? Su Chong. What? Tell him Su Chong. Su Chong. And how do you know that slant-eyed wonder? You're his lab assistant. I'm his lab assistant. If it escaped your notice, Andrew Ryan sunk us 5,000 fathoms below his shining city. How does Su Chong propose to get us back? That's between me. That's between me. And the slant. And the slant. But if I do this, the girl goes with me. Little sisters are worth their weight in gold. She's not up for negotiation. Last time I checked, back in the city they were making little sisters by the dozen. That's a right fairy tale you've dreamed up, sister. But if you're lying, we can just as well kill you tomorrow. Down here, we got nothing but time. In case I need to get hold of you. If you see Su Chong, tell him. Atlas says he hasn't forgotten him. I didn't kidnap her. Uh, but she made for some exceptional bait, didn't she? 
had to be done. Did it? I felt everything that every version of me felt. All of that knowledge. I lost a pinky, but that version of me, she lost everything. Comstock, that final Comstock, he thought he could avoid his guilt by coming here. You educated him proper. But then why am I back here? Huh? I don't remember opening a tear to come back. And who are you? Huh? I think you'll figure that out soon enough. Yeah, not too much to say about it just yet. I was in Paris. I, I was happy. And now I'm here dealing with this Atlas, this, this psychopath. What was I thinking? I wasn't Paris any more than I am Booker. Now I have to find this, this Su Chong, and I don't even know who that is. Not yet, but you know he's the key, don't you? To what? You're asking me. Elizabeth, I ain't even here. I like the way that they've gotten, you know, Booker's voice actor to be involved, even though he's kind of either dead or yeah, and in, in his happy ending. You know, just depends on the version. What are you? Huh? And how did you know exactly what to tell Atlas? Let me ask you a question. You feel like yourself, Elizabeth. <sighs> I feel... I feel strange and smaller. I, I can't see the doors. What's behind the doors? I, I can't see the future. I can't even see any tears. Ugh. Oh my god. S stay away from me. Booker. No. No. No, please. Please don't. I died here. I was killed by that... Then how am I here? How can I be dead in this world and yet my finger? What am I? Huh? I don't understand. I I If we're going to end up in the same place, it's a hard Are you being cute? I've come round to your way of thinking. Have you? Yes. I do believe one can change things. After all the bother, one often wishes that one had not. You're a fatalist. A physicist. A fatalist. So was Newton, especially when it came to apples falling from trees. They always contrived to land with a splat. She left the child to rot. Are you implying she's the apple? I'm implying that she did not fall far from the tree. And now she wants to go back. I need to go back. To fix what I broke. Back to where she has no right to be. Back to where she doesn't belong. Doesn't belong? Wait, what do you mean? Do you want to tell her brother, or shall I? Because I died. There are rules. Even for one such as you. She'll forget. All the doors. And what's behind all the doors. All close to her now. She'll be just like the rest of us. Forgetting the past. The present. The future. I'd wager she won't even remember this conversation. We've arrived. Or at least one version of Elizabeth. This will happen to her. You're trading omniscience and croissants for death and mildew. I left Sally to rot. For what? So I could punish Comstock? He was trying to help her, to save her, and I... If I don't make that right... We all have our crosses to bear. But there is a thin line between a martyr and a fool. Okay, but what about all the times Booker died? What happens to all the other Elizabeths? Because, you know, there's a lot of them. A lot of multiplicities of Elizabeths. The Lutesses warned me that if I came back here, I would collapse. Collapse? From a, a, a quantum superposition to just me. Uh, quantum what? I've changed, Booker. No tears, no cosmic knowledge. Just 
a normal girl. With a normal pinky. Peter, it, if I can't open tears, I, I'm never leaving here, am I? I I'm never going back to Paris. You're, and you, you're just... You're, you're just what? You're, you're just the fragments of my memory telling me what my future holds? You decided to come here, Elizabeth. You knew what that meant. Only option, as I see it, is to trust yourself. Find Su Chong. I think maybe I was supposed to hit the elevator button earlier. Well, it does give me a, a bit of a moment here, but yeah, I, I figure the idea is that this Elizabeth and the other dead Elizabeth, uh, they're just like spun off versions of the Elizabeth Gestalt. So there's still one of them out there. There's still the, the Gestalt out there. Even though these two are now just individual Elizabeths, I guess. I think I'm gonna have to use this air grabber. That's gonna be messy. I don't know if I'm head will serve just as well. It'd be a hell of a lot quieter, too. And that's not what you would have done. I'm not Booker. Just because your father did something one way, doesn't mean you have to. Ah! I ain't letting a good lead like you get away! In other words, the, uh, the gameplay has shifted now that we're playing Elizabeth instead. And they're just sort of warning us. Sort of like how they're warning us that uh, water puddles and piles of glass will alert the enemy. But before I actually do anything, I think I'll just cut it off here. And, uh, do you remember that red balloon? That wasn't just some random choice. That was a reference to the classic 1956 French short film Le Ballon Rouge, The Red Balloon. In fact, hell, why not? Let's head on back to Film Corner and take a closer look at all you can say with a balloon that you can't say with words. The plot. The red balloon begins with a kid walking down a steep hill to go to school. The kid is never named within the film, so let's just call him Pascal, since that's the actor's name. Pascal gets distracted in the first shot and stops to pet a cat. But halfway down the hill, he gets distracted again when he spots something on a lamppost and climbs up to get it. Though we couldn't see it at first, it turns out to be an unusually spherical red balloon, and the kid decides to untie it from the lamppost and take it with him. When Pascal tries to climb aboard a bus with the balloon, the ticket collector refuses to let him on. In response, Pascal shrugs and decides to run the rest of the way to the public all-boys school he attends. He asks the janitor to take care of his balloon while he's inside, and incidentally, this is one of the very few lines which are clearly spoken throughout the entire film. By the time school lets out, it started raining, and so Pascal attempts to shield his balloon from the rain by borrowing the umbrella of a passing old man. After doing the same thing with a few other strangers with umbrellas, Pascal eventually makes it home. However, his... I want to say grandmother? His grandmother isn't too impressed with the balloon, and so she tosses it out the window. But now here's where things get interesting. Instead of just floating away, the balloon turns around and proceeds to hover by the window until Pascal notices it and lets it back inside. The next morning, as Pascal leaves his home to go to school again, he tells the balloon to be on its best behavior, and in response, it teases him by refusing to let him grab its string. At one point, Pascal hides behind a corner so he can grab the string and prove who's in charge, but then the red balloon retaliates by hiding in a doorway and then teasing Pascal with the string again. Still, when Pascal gets on the bus this time, he asks the balloon to follow him, and it does. When Pascal gets to school, there's a crowd of boys waiting for him, and all of them try to get the balloon, which responds by hovering just out of their reach. Soon afterwards, school starts and everybody goes inside, but as the balloon hovers right by the windows, the boys inside raise a ruckus. A man, let's say he's the principal, tries to grab the balloon so it'll stop being a distraction, but as with everyone else, the balloon stays just out of reach and even manages to sneak in through a window, 
making the situation inside even worse. Figuring that Pascal is the root of the problem, the principal pulls him out of class and locks him in his office before wandering off to conduct some business elsewhere. However, the balloon decides to follow the principal after he locks Pascal away, and it teases the older man relentlessly until he finally returns and lets Pascal out. Since school is over by this point, and now there's no rain, Pascal decides to spend some time wandering around a flea market. He's particularly fascinated by a near life-size painting of a girl his own age, and the red balloon spends some time, well, I'd say admiring its own reflection, but it doesn't exactly have eyes, does it? Either way, as they head home, they pass a young girl, played by Pascal's real-life sister, who happens to be carrying a blue balloon. The red balloon is intrigued by the blue balloon, and the blue balloon turns out to be intrigued by the red balloon, but eventually they are separated by their respective owners. As Pascal approaches the top of the hill he lives on, he's ambushed by a group of boys from his school who still want to have his balloon. However, Pascal and his balloon manage to outmaneuver the boys and reach their apartment safely, though if you look carefully at their faces, it doesn't seem like the boys are ready to give up just yet. The next day is Sunday, and Pascal and his grandmother go to church. Unfortunately, the balloon follows them, and soon afterwards they're all ejected by the church usher. Catholicism is too uptight for a big red balloon, I guess. Anyway, Pascal wanders off on his own after that, but when he stops to buy a pastry, some of his classmates discover the balloon waiting for him outside and capture it. The boys tie a longer string to the balloon and take it to their hangout. Once there, they start climbing over themselves in order to fire slingshots at it and whack it with their sticks. Meanwhile, Pascal runs all around Paris looking for the red balloon, and when he spots it, he manages to sneak up on the other side of a wall and untie it from the longer string. What follows is an extended chase scene as Pascal flees the boys and climbs back up the hill towards his apartment, but this time he doesn't make it the whole way up. He's eventually surrounded on an empty field and held down, and while he shouts for the balloon to fly away to safety, one of the boys finally manages to land a direct hit with his slingshot. Ever so slowly, the balloon starts to shrink and fall to the ground, and after a solid minute of milking its death scene, one of the boys gets bored and stomps it flat. At the very moment of the red balloon's end, all the other balloons scattered across Paris leap out of their owner's hands, charge out of their windows, and otherwise start making their way to the top of the hill. In the process, we get to see a lot of pretty nice panoramic shots of the 1950s Paris skyline. But the balloons all eventually make their way up the hill and surround Pascal, who has remained behind to mourn his lost balloon. Excited by all his new friends, he starts tying all the balloon strings together, and once he's tied himself to the loose end, they all take off, heading into the unknown, as Parisians watch from the streets and windows below. And as the music swells and we catch a glimpse of the Eiffel Tower in the far-off distance, the film ends. The Analyses The Red Balloon is a lot like Metropolis, in that your personal interpretation generally says more about you than it says about the work itself. But where Metropolis is passing on a centrist message about how we all need to get along before we wind up tearing each other apart, the Red Balloon is childish nonsense. It is intentionally childish nonsense, and I don't mean that as an insult either. It is very good about being what it wants to be, and what it wants to be is childish nonsense. I highly recommend this film to anyone who has 30 minutes to spare. But between the intriguing sequence of events and the lack of dialogue to contextualize what we see, people have come up with a lot of different interpretations that assign a deeper meaning to the story. Now, the simplest analysis is that the story is a tale about a boy and a stray dog, except that the dog happens to be played by a big red balloon. Most of the scenes make perfect sense in this light. A dog can't come onto public transportation or into churches. The grandmother doesn't want one in the apartment, 
and all the boys at school would certainly be jealous if one of them suddenly came to school with a cute little dog. The balloon is intrigued by other balloons, other dogs, and it's smart and it's playful enough to tease its owner. The ending becomes even sadder when you imagine a bunch of boys being that cruel to a dog, but after that, well, the substitution kind of breaks apart when all the other balloons show up and carry Pascal away. Is the movie saying that he gets adopted by a pack of wild dogs, becomes a dog whisperer? Well, I did say it was supposed to be nonsense. A slightly more complicated interpretation basically has the balloon stand in for childhood dreams and fantasies in general. Naturally, a kid playing pretend in the classroom or in a church would be disrupting things and would get him kicked out. And while his schoolmates might be entertained by his antics, they would also bully him relentlessly for standing out. And while he would be interested in another kid playing pretend, he's still young enough to be selfish about his imaginary world, and so Pascal and the girl pass like ships in the night, despite how they have so much in common. In this context, the ending means that Pascal isn't going to let the world get him down, no matter what they do, to try to shatter his dreams. Next, there's an interpretation that states that the Red Balloon is a critique of then-modern French society. The post-war period in France lasted roughly 15 years, and that includes 1956, the year the Red Balloon came out. And it was marked by a new and unstable government, the Fourth Republic. The Fourth would eventually dissolve and be peacefully replaced in 1958 by the Fifth Republic, which is the French government as it stands today. But even in the late 50s, the scars of World War II were still very much fresh. And you can see them in the Red Balloon, in the broken remains of bombed out buildings and fields pockmarked by battle. In this critique of society interpretation, the Red Balloon is an indictment of the rule of force, hearkening both to the German occupation and to France's brutal policies regarding colonial insurrections. Keep in mind that Vietnam was France's colony up until its successful rebellion in 1954, and the question of what to do about Algeria and how violently it should happen actively ended the Fourth Republic, just as the question of slavery once destroyed the American Whig Party. Thus, the boy and his balloon represent a desire for independence, one that's denied by every authority figure for no stated reason, and one that's crushed by mob violence sparked by hatred, greed, and xenophobia. There's a Christian interpretation, where the red balloon dies for our sins. As a Christ figure, the balloon represents Pascal's Holy Spirit, his personal connection to Jesus. This spirit is simultaneously sought after and despised by the material-minded around us, and so while the schoolboys covet the balloon, they also try to destroy it. And they happen to do so by stoning it to death on an open field on the top of a hill. Still, they can't destroy the religious spirit no matter how hard they try, which is why more balloons rush in to rescue Pascal from his grief and lift him into the sky. Oh, and did you know that there's an objectivist interpretation too? The idea is that everyone is born with a big, beautiful balloon, but most of us lose it at some point during our childhood. Or else, everyone gets a balloon, but some of them are just scrawny or withered. The unlucky ones, the majority, are thus jealous of the fortunate few who get the best balloons. And so they conspire together to discriminate against those with balloons, and they eventually destroy that which they cannot possess. As such, the ending is the result of what happens when those who are talented get together and create something amazing despite all attempts to stop them. Of course, this interpretation adds a lot of unsupported backstory to the work, and it ignores the fact that Pascal found the red balloon randomly tied to a lamppost, but who am I to argue? Personal Thoughts So, which interpretation is correct? All of them. Any of them. 
Whichever interpretation makes the most sense to you, that's the one it is. For you. I can tell you which one I agree with the most, that being the dog one, but maybe you like one of the other interpretations better. And that's fine. Death of the author is the acknowledgement of the fact that the audience is an active participant in the interpretation of a work. And if you get a different meaning out of something than someone who's lived a different life, then that's fine. Even if you wind up misremembering or inventing details that weren't in the original work, that's fine. Although after a certain point, it stops becoming interpretation and becomes reinterpretation and projecting other people's creations into your own fantasies instead of the other way around. And overall, it is best to acknowledge when you're doing this. But having an active imagination isn't a bad thing, at least so long as you aren't hurting anyone. And of course, you can still hurt people without having to project your own beliefs about reality onto someone's innocent book or painting. So basically, it's all right with me if you think and do whatever you want. Just don't be a dick. Okay? Don't be a dick. Thanks for joining me again in Film Corner, and I hope I'll see you soon.